The root of the word is jihada, which means to strive for a better way of life. The nouns are jud, mujahid, jihad, and ishjihad. Now, for us to understand the evolution of the concept of jihad in the Quran, and the way in which Islam developed its approach to regulating war, we need to do so in the context of the history of the Prophet's mission. The Prophet was born in Mecca. He first received the revelation of the Quran in Mecca. The revelations continued after he migrated to Medina. And the Quran is compiled of these revelations over this long period of 23 years. Now, when the Prophet communicated his revelation to the inhabitants of Mecca, this generated huge resentment on the part of their leaders. They began a campaign of persecution against him and his companions, including all kinds of humiliation, torture, attempted assassinations, etc. At this time, Muslims did not engage in fighting. Instead, they twice migrated to escape persecution, firstly to Abyssinia, the Christian kingdom, and later to Medina. Now, the first Quranic verses on jihad were revealed during this early period in Mecca, long before Muslims were given permission to fight. And these referred explicitly to peaceful struggle in the cause of God. And some of the verses are there. They, they are pretty self-explanatory. Um, of particular interest are some of the hadith. Um, should I inform you of who the mu'min, the believer, is? It is he from whom people are secure with regards to their wealth and their own selves. The Muslim is he from whose tongue and hand other people are safe. The mujahid is he who performs jihad in the obedience, guarding against jihad against the nafs, the ego, in the obedience of God. So this is the axiomatic definition of someone, a mujahid, someone who fights in the way of God, that's the traditional understanding. That's the axiomatic definition of what a mujahid is. Similarly, from Abu Naim reports, the best jihad is for one to perform jihad against his own self etc etc so there is this concept of a greater jihad and that jihad is the jihad which is internal spiritual and also social in terms of self advancement but what about the issue of war the criteria and conditions for war and again we need a bit of history after the prophet and the fledgling muslim community had migrated to medina to escape persecution the tribe of quraysh escalated its attempt to destroy them they ordered a thousand foot soldiers and a hundred cavalry to attack Medina. It was only at this point that the first Quranic verse permitting physical fighting was revealed. The whole thing, the verse is there, as you can read. Truly God defends those who have faith, etc. etc. Permission is given to those who are attacked because they are oppressed. It was a very specific condition. Those who are driven out from their homes without a just cause, except that they say for no reason except that we say our nurture is God, etc. And if God did not prevent some people by others, God is explaining in the Quran, then cloisters, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of God is remembered would have been destroyed. So there is a broad justification. It's not just about even it's not just about the Islamic faith, it's about multiple faiths. Oops. Three principles. War can only be fought in response to an attack. This attack is such that it creates unbearable conditions of oppression and persecution. The motive of war is purely to remove those conditions of oppression, to permit not only Muslim but people of all faiths in practicing their beliefs. So the Quran has fundamentally, in that first verse, defined the terms of just war as a defensive war of resistance against aggression. Now what I'm going to do now is go through various Quranic verses that are often taken out of context by extremists on the Muslim side as well as extremists on the non-Muslim side who don't like Muslims. So we have this one. Fight the ones where there is no persecution. The religion is only for God. It's often kind of interpreted as we have to keep fighting until there is just, there's just one religion. It's God's religion. It's Islam. That's it. But again, it's just plucking it out of context. Even within that, even within that specific context of that chapter, if you look at the verses before and after, completely different meaning. And fight the way of God against those who fight against you. Do not commit aggression. God does not love aggressors. Very, very clear, unequivocal. And slay them wherever you catch them. Turn them out from where they've turned you out. Persecution is worse than slaughter. But if they seize, God is oft forgiving, most merciful. If they stop, then you have to stop. Fight them on until there's no oppression or persecution, and religion is only for God. But if they seize, let there be no hostility except to those who practice oppression. 
etc. Whoever then commits aggression against you, attack him accordingly, but remain conscious of God. So it's clear that the only reason the Muslims are permitted to declare war is in response to military aggression and persecution. It's also clear that the objective of fighting is not to coerce people into accepting Islam or to impose the sovereignty of, of an Islamic state, but rather to re-establish the condition in which Muslims are able to practice their religion only for God. Hence the specific conditionality that if those fighting you seize their oppression, the Muslims are obliged to stop fighting in kind. Okay, the next verse. Perpetual war. Make ready against them whatever. I mean, these are quoted by classical scholars. Even. Not just, not just extremists, even by classical scholars in particular. Make ready against them whatever force and war amounts you're able to muster. So this, and they've used it to say that you know, we have to be in this continual state of war, continually preparing for war against, you know, it could be anybody. You don't know who they are. Again, plucked out of context, both before and after. And what's interesting is the Quran, you're not just supposed to look at one chapter, you're supposed to look at the whole book. But even within one chapter, you can see the context is very, very clear. As for those with whom you have made a covenant, and who thereupon break their covenant on every occasion, remember the reference to the covenant of Medina before the, the, the pact, mutual security, etc. If you find them at, more, at war with you, make of them a fearsome example of those who follow them, so that they might take it to heart. Or if you have reason to fear treason from people with whom you have made a covenant, cast it back at them in an equitable manner. For verily God does not love the treasure. She's actually giving two examples. One, if someone's making war with you in violation of the treaty, then you essentially, you, you basically, you know, you're permitted to have, you basically respond with war. But if, 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 you, if you think there's treason going on, you don't just go into war. You have to deal with it in an equitable manner. There has to be, and then the response has to be proportional. Going on, then, then, then you can see in, the, in that context, hence make ready against them whatever force, etc. And then, but if they incline to peace, incline you to it as well. Again, see the themes repeated. And place your trust in God. Verily, he alone is all hearing and all knowing. And further, it says, and should they seek but to deceive you by their show of peace, behold, God is enough for you. So what it's saying is that, look, even if they say that, okay, it's, we want peace, and you think, you know, these guys are pretending, they're going to they're do something, they're gonna, you know, you want a preemptive strike, whatever. You have to take it at face value. And this is justified by many Quranic commentaries. Razi, for example, he says, even if they offer peace only with a view to deceive you, this peace must be accepted since all judgment of their intentions must be based on outward evidence alone. So you have to have an evidential basis. Next verse, which is again routinely misinterpreted, actually I'll give you two in one go and then we'll go through them. So, in the sacred month, slay, basically just the idea is, you know, go around killing everyone, take everyone captive, and do it until they convert to Islam. That's the kind of generic, that's the way it's used in that, in that context. This is specifically against, um, supposed to be against polytheists. This is applying specifically, according to most commentators, Jews and Christians. And again, it's been interpreted, taken out of context, interpreted to say, well, you know, that's it. Muslims are obliged to fight against Jews and Christians, subordinate them until they pay the Jizya tax. That's it, you know, there's no condition. So forget, I mean, let's, you know, let's forget all the context that we've just looked at. We just... Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, took that particular verse and used it as the basis for his whole example that there is an obligation to fight against, to fight, to expand into non-Muslim lands. So it's very important that we interrogate this issue. Again, on the first verse, again, there is context everywhere. But I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the issue of forcible conversion before we go specifically to the issues of that verse. Does Islam in any way endorse or allow forcible conversion to Islam? Categorically, unequivocally, no way. This is just a couple of examples. There's other verses as well. And I don't think I need to go through them, and they're absolutely clear. You just simply cannot force anyone to, to believe in Islam. Islam clearly, clearly, axiomatically states that belief is something that comes from within, and you have to respect and acknowledge difference of opinion. There will be difference, there will be plurality. To you is unto your way, to me is unto my way. It's fine, we can live together, no one has to force anyone. It's very, very clear. 